Hi, I'm Laura Mize, pediatric speech language pathologist, and welcome to Teach Me to Talk the podcast. Today we're continuing the autism podcast series, and we're all the way up to focus area number 10. Now, if you haven't been watching, all this information is from my latest therapy manual, the Autism Workbook, Developing Speech Therapy Treatment Plans for Toddlers and Preschoolers uh, with ASD. So take a look at that. If you've not gotten a chance uh, to look at that, you can find all that information at Teach Me to Talk. Com. Today we're going to be working or talking about how we work on facilitating peer interaction when children have markers for ASD. So let's just get started here. So one of the core diagnostic features of autism, and I'm going to read it directly from the official diagnostic criteria, is persistent deficits in social interaction and social communication across multiple settings and contexts. So a little bit later we're going to break that down definition down, but what does that mean? It means that kids who have young, uh, young children, kids who have markers for ASD seem to uh, ignore or avoid interaction with other people, and a lot of times it's even worse with kids who are their own age. And so what can we do about this? We know that we have to treat it, we know that we have to work on it, but sometimes the things that we think are common sense to do uh, to get those interactions going don't really work. One of the most common recommendations that I hear all the time from pediatricians is put the child in daycare or put the child in a little Mother's Day Out program or plan little play dates. Guys, with kids with autism, that is just not effective. So many times we even sort of make it worse because kids then, then get into these repetitive patterns of negative behavior with other children or in group situations, and it just makes it worse for them. So I wanna tell you today the five steps or stages, or you could think about them as strategies, but they are very concrete things that we can do with toddlers and preschoolers with autism or markers for autism so that we we can help get that peer interaction going. All right, the good news is when we get this going, we often see pretty um, immediate results with kids. And so even if you're looking at a child right now and you think he is just so far from this, this is just something that I'm just concerned that he's never gonna be able to fit in. He's never gonna be able to go to school. These are the things that really, really help facilitate uh, that, that process and really help them be able to build those friendships and build those social relationships with other children. So let's go back to what I mentioned just a minute ago with uh, talking about the differences that we see in uh, making friends or building relationships or the technical terms that we're using today, facilitating peer interaction. Let's just break that down so that you can understand exactly what each of those words and those definitions uh, in that definition means. And this is how I do it too with when I'm working with parents so that they really, really get it and they're not just thinking, gosh, this is just due to a lack of exposure. If he's around other kids more often, he's gonna he's gonna play with other kids. If he's if I just send him to daycare, if I send him to daycare this whole year, it's just gonna magically get better. And again, th the nature of autism is that kids really have these social interaction issues as part of, again, that uh, diagnosis. So let's break down these words. Persistent, one of the core diagnostic features of autism is persistent deficits. So again, that means even if you, you, you give them opportunities to be with other children, it's not gonna improve or go away on its own with just exposure, with just a little bit more practice. We have to really help children get in there and, and uh, understand how to interact with other kids, understand why and, and start to get that benefit. And again, some of this is so above what we would expect even typically developing children to be able to do at two and three and four. But my point here is that we've got to do intervention. It's not going to go away on its own. It won't go away again just with exposure or uh, repeated experiences with other children. The social interaction piece, sometimes I talk to parents about this and they'll say, you know, he watches other kids. He's aware of other kids. But there is a big, big difference between watching and interacting. Watching is just passive. And for kids who seem to ignore or avoid other children and adults, certainly watching comes first. And we're going to talk about that in the first step or the first stage that uh, I've found to be really, really useful with kids who are struggling with this 
uh, with social interaction. But again, we have to know that this is just more than social awareness. And, and sometimes parents really don't get that. And they don't understand that it's really that back and forth exchange or that reciprocity. We don't only want them to watch their cousin <laughs> as their cousin plays on the playground. We want them with their cousin. We want them both talking to and looking at and sharing that experience with each other. So not just social awareness. And when kids don't have the social awareness piece, again, sometimes parents don't even really understand that until we point that out. They think, oh, he's just a loner. He's choosing to be on the periphery of the playground. And in some ways he really is, but it's because he doesn't understand how to interact. And so that can be very, very self-isolating with children. And so when we don't address these problems head on, we actually can compound the issues that a child may have in social situations like birthday parties, like community outings, like family gatherings, like church, like that, that whatever you want to do, whatever your family does with other people. And so when we, again, when we when we miss that this is a part of autism that we have to really, really intervene with and really, really uh, address to make better, we can actually make that problem a little bit worse. So that was, that was the first piece that I wanted to talk about, or the second piece actually. Persistent, it's not gonna go away. Just with uh, throw them in there and they're just gonna automatically get better. Social interaction means actually engaging with other people. Uh, actually being with them and participating and sharing that event, not just awareness. And the next piece with that is social communication. And I talked about this with the back and forth exchanges. The nonverbal piece comes first with this. And so lots of times too, you think, well, he's not gonna interact with other kids because he can't talk. That's not really what happens first. Kids do things nonverbally. So again, we talked about eye contact. We talked about uh, exchanging or sharing toys. We talked about just, or I, I didn't mention this yet, but just being with another child and again just that that sense that someone else is here and I I notice that and I like that and I'm not trying to get away from that so that's what we're talking about too with social communication uh, and again the other part of this uh, very important part of this diagnostic criteria was that these kids have difficulty across multiple settings and contexts and so a lot of times parents will think well he doesn't have a social interaction problem because he's fine with me at home but then you get him in a situation a lot of times parents will say the evaluation that he had to go to school or the the preschool program or the evaluation with the speech pathologist was just the most horrible day of his life. It's because it was a new situation, a new context, and that's why some of the things that parents will see at home, they'll say, gosh, his eye contact is so good with me. Oh, he wants to sit and read a book with me. He wants to play toys with me. Those kinds of things that they think there's really not a problem with social interaction. And sometimes parents can kind of talk them out of a diagnosis or talk themselves out of a diagnosis of autism because they're just looking at how a child interacts with them or with maybe a sibling or a grandparent or maybe a, a babysitter that he or she uh, sees all the time and again when we start seeing children that they're they have difficulties you know they're they have difficulties when you take them to the pediatrician's office. They have difficulty when they're in the grocery store interacting with other people. Again, we just see it across multiple situations. And so that certainly is an indicator that there is a that there is an issue with uh, interaction and with, with so, that social connectedness. Again, it doesn't, and we have to look at more than that, how that child does at home and just with his, his people. We have to look at how he interacts with the new people because every kid that he, he meets is gonna be new for a while. We have to see how he interacts with new adults too. And so that's just what I wanted to talk about. Uh, sometimes kids with autism and, or markers for autism, again, are pretty engaged at home, but you know, with COVID now, lasting well over a year. So many parents and grandparents are emailing me at my website at Teach Me To Talk and saying, you know, my, my grandchild is 17 months old and she's never even been to Walmart. <laughs> or my grandchild is two and a half and we just started realizing that there might be a problem with communication when COVID started and we haven't been able to do anything about it. Now I'm just really, really concerned with how he looks and he hasn't been around other people at all. And I'm, I'm afraid that this problem is just uh, going to keep compounding. And I can see how limiting this whole situation has been because he hasn't gotten to be around other people. And so again, we have to really, really look at that 
and understand what we can do uh, to make that better. Uh, many times, again, we, we're, when we're looking at this, we talked about that first difference. The second difference here is that difficulty building and maintaining social relationships. And again, we're specifically talking about with same age peers here. And so kids with autism really, really struggle with that. And sometimes it looks like disinterest, like we've already mentioned, when in reality is that a toddler or preschooler with autism uh, doesn't understand how to interact with other people, doesn't understand why he would even wanna do that. It's not as rewarding to him. So again, we have to do some really, really specific things to make that better. Uh, young children with autism I almost always prefer to hang out with older children or with adults and the reason that is is because their behavior is so much more predictable and we as adults or even older children who have that maternal or paternal instinct sort of built into them that nurturing built into them they 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 see that with kids who are struggling and we try we try to nurture that and we try to compensate for their difficulties but so many times same age peers aren't going to be mature enough to do that especially in this toddler preschool development developmental uh, phase. So when we talk about this, uh uh, one of the things that we well we'll get to that in a minute so I just I just wanted to talk about again this isn't just disinterest this isn't just that again we said he prefers to be a loner that's not it it goes beyond that so I wanted to talk about those two core differences so how do we know when we're supposed to really work on social interaction with other children well let me give you some indicators first of all when there are no regular interactions with other children including siblings we know that we're gonna have to get in there and do some things to make this better the second time that I think this approach or the things that we're going to talk about today are is so effective is when children are showing just a little spark of initial initial interest in watching other children but they don't seem to know what to do after that and again sometimes parents mistake this for social interaction when it has to just go so much beyond uh, that point and so but I, I like I like these these strategies especially when we see that little spark there because you think oh I've got something to work with so that's uh, something there and then the third uh, time that we see that we've got to do something to really intervene and get this peer interaction going is when a child has problems interacting with other children and I alluded to this a minute ago when we when we have a child that's in a daycare situation or a Mother's Day Out program or wherever we, we have him or mom and dad work and he said the babysitters Sometimes kids, again, because of the nature of autism and because of the, the things that they struggle with, that pattern of interacting with other children just, it, it just gets started in a really negative cycle. And so we might see aggression, we might see massive passiveness, which just makes that child even a, almost a target. And you don't really, you know, we don't like to say that, but kids even at two and at three and at four in a situation know when a child is not going to uh, be able to defend themselves in a little power struggle that they're going to have over a toy. And so sometimes we see our little friends with autism who again just end up so passive in these situations and they do kind of stick to the periphery of a social situation. And so you'll see them at McDonald's in the in the uh, little playland there and they're just off to the side and again it looks like they're doing their own thing and, and it looks like they're happy and and they are but at the same time we want them really really in there and so when we have kids who are struggling with social interaction already we know that we've got to intervene and do uh, do some things so we are going to go ahead and move forward and talk about these five steps or five stages. And I really use these sequentially with most kids, meaning that I start with this first thing and then we do the second thing and then we do the third thing. But when we get to the end of the show today, I'm gonna to tell you some things that you can do if you think, what if he's a little bit beyond that? What, what if I do this instead? Or if a child has really marked or uh, really strong activity preferences and you think, oh, this, this might work better. I'm gonna I'm going to skip these little things because I think we can get here and maybe go back and then pick up these other uh, stages or steps that you're talking about. Sometimes it really is driven by a child's own individual preferences. So we'll talk about that as well. So what is the first step? And if you are following along, 
Uh, each podcast that we do uh, now, especially if you're watching on YouTube, you can you can see that I always have a handout with that. And if you are a therapist and need continuing education credit, no matter whether you are a speech language pathologist like me, or an OT or a PT or a developmental interventionist, what, whatever you do that you need continuing education credits for, we can help you with that. And this show uh, for uh, only five bucks, you can get an hour credit there and you can find out information about that process in the link there below if you're watching on YouTube. If you're listening just through your regular podcast app, go to Teach Me to Talk and this show is number 412. And again, with the purchase of the CE credit, you can get the handout which will walk you through uh, these five things that we're gonna talk about today. So what is the first thing that we do when we are considering working on facilitating peer interaction with kids uh, with autism? It's not going to really make sense to you, but we don't start with adults. We, uh, we don't start with kids. We start with adults. So when we see that a child is having difficulty interacting with other children, sometimes, again, like we said, the, the kind of common sense recommendation that you would think would work is let's just put them around other kids and see what happens. But that's not really effective with kids who are really struggling with social interaction on this level. It's not that they're just shy. It's not that they just haven't seen other kids. It's that there is a real neurological difference and how they interact with other people. So because of that, we're going to target engagement and interaction first with adults. And sometimes, that, again, that's hard for parents to kind of see. But I like to say, uh, like we talked about before, with an adult, the behavior is more predictable, so the child can really depend on that a little bit more. He's not quite as... Uh, the, uh, the adult will make the compensations. The adult will be able to look at him and really gauge their own responses, engage their own initiations with what they should do based on what the child is doing. So we want to be sure that we are starting with adults first, and especially with adults who may not be as familiar with the child. And that certainly is the case when a child is referred to us a new referral on our caseloads they don't know us yet which makes us again that new person but it's it's fantastic that we start kind of looking at interaction at that level with how can I get him to interact with me how, what is he going to do with me because I know what to do I know how to cue him I know the strategies that work I can read his signals I can adjust my own behavior based on what he's doing and so if you haven't already started that with a kid if you were just looking at a child with autism as a therapist and you're thinking oh mom says he does terrible at daycare what am I going to do the first thing that you need to do is get him interacting really really well with you and get that get that social interaction piece going with you and now in this day and age of consultative model and coaching model with uh, early intervention services sometimes therapists feel so limited like our hands are tied and what we can really offer families and offer children as far as direct service provision vision. But I'm just going to tell you, when we're working on social interaction as, the, as that child's therapist, you have got to get in there. You cannot just let it be, okay, I'm going to talk to mom about these things and, and get mom, help, help mom see these things. Yes, we're doing that, but the child is already connected to mom. That That's usually not what's going on. So again, when we're talking about we want to help him learn how to be more connected and more interactive with other people, you are the best first new person for that interaction to begin with. So don't shy away from that and don't, don't let somebody tell you <laughs> how to do your job when you know the best place for me to do this is, again, that direct intervention where he's interacting with me and where I get this going with him. And I model for mom how to do this because, again, if mom doesn't ever see somebody do it who is new and the struggles that you're going to have and the struggles that her child is going to have learning how to interact with you, she may not ever see the social interaction issues as well as she would see it, she would see how he responds to you. And that's what you talk about it, you know, how you talk about it with moms too. And sometimes moms will just say something like, you're so good with kids. He, he just responds to you better than anybody. And part of us wants to just say, 
thanks and just kind of move on. But you've got to really explain that. You've got to say, oh, you don't even realize. I mean, you might think this is all just kind of internal and we just have this magical connection, but that's not going on at all. I'm really watching him. I'm really understanding him. I'm really basing every single thing that I do and say with him based on what he's already doing. And I'm not doing that just because that's just uh, naturally been downloaded into me. I'm doing that because I've learned how to do these things and I've honed my skills and my strategies. And so you've got to really talk parents through that and say, it's not just me here. It's because I'm compensating. And I, again, I'm using these really, really specific strategies. And sometimes too with parents, let's, let's say that it doesn't go that well. Let's say that you're in our interactions with that child really are strained and really are a challenge from the very beginning and again a parent might think that's just her that's just that therapist she, she's just not as competent as I need her to be and you've got to really really talk a parent through that and say this is what's happening with your child this this is what we would like to see and so again the parents aren't really thinking that it's just about you whether it's really positive or negative and I hope that you're understanding my example there that you can really, really talk parents through that. So if we do have kids, so, so let's, let's talk about how we do this. So how do we target social interaction as an adult with the child so that we can facilitate that peer interaction later? And again, the big thing is just getting that initial connection. And the very best way that I've found to do that, and certainly research supports this, is with by using social interactive games so that kids learn how to do your, their part within a structured activity. So little games like peekaboo, like row, row your boat, like ride a little horsey, like a game like uh, ready, set, go, where you're chasing a child, and they learn to be with you. They learn, oh, when we say ready, set, go, they learn what those words mean. I'm going to run across the room, and then they they start to, after you've played the game with them long enough, they start to look for you over their shoulders. They're anticipating that you're coming too. And so can you see how that's a lot more than awareness? They're doing something to let you know, hey, I like you. I like this game. I want you to play this with me. This isn't me just running away from you and me doing my own thing. This is us really, really sharing this experience together. And so the social interaction piece with social games, it sounds, a lot of times it sounds really easy. And I've realized that I talk about it so much and do it so much. And I'm, I'm pretty optimistic when I'm sharing strategies that sometimes people think that I think it's really, really easy when I know that it's not, because I had to just teach myself to push through that discomfort when we're trying to get a child to play with us like that and interact with us and just to keep going no matter how, uh, how much of just a bomb <laughs> that the game is going or just how, how much, how, just whatever the struggle is there, you just have to keep going and you just have to push through that discomfort, not only so that you grow as a therapist and you learn when this kid does this, I'm going to do this so that for the next seven or eight or a hundred kids that you see, you think I've learned from this experience. When I played this social game with this child back in 2021, I learned that when a kid does this, I'm going to do that. And so with social games, again, I'm not saying that that's always the easiest thing to do or the easiest strategy to get going, but it is the best one because again, you've got the structure of the game so that there's predictability there. There's repetitiveness so that the child learns what to expect with that routine and so that he begins to do his part and so that's where we want to start again with uh, with these kinds of kids so that they learn to interact with someone who is not in their immediate family, their immediate social circle. So once we've gotten social interaction going, and again, you don't have to do social games. You might be able to get that going with play with toys or whatever you are really, really good at that you have honed your skills with and you think, ah, this is how I can get a kid. This is, this is what the two-year-olds that I see all respond to. Once you get that going with a few key adults, you know, and as the therapist, you're going to do these games. You're going to teach the parents how to do the games. Parents, hopefully, are going to teach a grandparent or a babysitter or someone else. So that we've got a little circle of adults all working with this kid, and everybody's getting great responses. You see that social interaction, that that uh, that competency uh, on the child's part, really building with several people. 
uh, then and only then are you going to introduce other children. And so can you see how sometimes we skip that step? We just expect uh, to start to see a child in therapy or uh, we may say something like, again, like that pediatrician recommendation, recommendation that we're just going to put them in daycare and everything's just going to magically get better with peer interaction, um, which we've already talked about how <laughs> that doesn't always work. But uh, with that, we have to be sure that we are... Um, making sure that we build that competency and build that, build the child's skills uh, through uh, those repeated interactions. Now, before this year, I would have, pro last year really, I would have probably uh, almost always talked about, let, let's, get it, let's get them in a little uh, specialized preschool program. And especially when a child has turned three and they can go to public preschool or they can go to even a private preschool where the teachers, it's not just uh, a babysitting kind of thing, where there are licensed teachers there and they are really, really looking at children individually and really, really working out educational plans. Uh, before last year, I probably would have said, you know, that's going to be the best setting to work on uh, peer interaction, that's going to be the best way to do it. Let's get them in there and just, uh, again, not the same as daycare Mother's Day out, a little bit, a step above that. But, you know, I really started uh, when we moved to uh, Central Kentucky and opened our clinic here, I started just working on social interaction in a completely different way. And it really wasn't even something that I planned to do. I had run playgroup programs before and that was my intention. But I really just started having uh, one child at a time and then just adding one more child with them. And so that using that little dyad approach, which is what we would call it in the professional literature, where it's just one child that I'm working with and then one other child, seemed to work so much better than just throwing a child in a classroom setting. And so I got much faster results than I've previously experienced when I worked with larger groups, even four or six children. And by the terms of child care, you know, that's a pretty low ratio uh, for kids. But when we're looking at children with different developmental needs, or especially a kid who's on the spectrum, that that little, if we can, if we can break it down and we can start to really introduce the social interaction piece with just one other child, again, I think that we, uh, I think, I think that we can do a lot better with that. The other thing that we want to do when we're looking for one other child to really participate in helping uh, a child with autism develop social interaction skills and peer relationships, you want to be careful who you're picking as your other child. Sometimes, and as a therapist, I bet you can relate to this, sometimes we'll have children in these kinds of situations and we'll have our kid that we think of as our therapy kid or a kid that we're working with who's qualified for services and then we'll try to put them with a typically developing peer. And then sometimes we have to do more work with a typically developing peer to keep them on track with what we want them to do uh, versus the kid that we're seeing for therapy. And so be sure that you are choosing your other children carefully. You want coachable children or children who are going to be pretty easy to guide through this process. And so that's something that I want you to really think about too. And a lot of times as SLPs, we're just going to put two of our therapy kids together and think, oh, this is, you know, we're working on peer interaction just because we have two children there that's not necessarily the case so try to always make sure that you you're thinking about that it's not just that there's another kid there at the beginning you want this to be as easy as you can make it so that was step number one we're going to target engagement first with adults we're going to get that going with a few key adults and if we can we're going to try to get it going even across multiple settings so that we're sure that a child really is able to do this at home he's able to do this in your wherever your therapy setting is if you see kids at home you're going to think about where can i see them community wise and again with covid that's a little bit more of a challenge with everywhere is not open yet but even other places like even playing with you in the park is different with that uh, is different from a child interacting with you at where you normally have therapy so e even that is a pretty big um, part needs to be a pretty big part of your treatment plan is he going to do okay with me here in this situation that he's gotten so used to let me see if i can make that uh, let's challenge him a little bit further and, and let's see what we can do same person same routine same same game same toys whatever you want to think about it but can he do it in a different place so that certainly is a part of that step one that we're going to do then in the other part of step one remember what we said is we're going to pick really coachable children <laughs> and siblings are sometimes perfect for this because 
even if they're just a little bit older, they already sort of start to compensate for baby brother or sister's uh, actions. That's part of being a family. We learn what our, our quirks are with the other people that we love and see the most, and we adjust ourselves to that. But uh, again, that's the second part of step number one is we're going to pick a child who's really, really coachable. So then... Stage number two, what are we going to do? We are going to move to target, not sit down play where these kids are together and we give we put a, we put blocks out and we want everybody to play nicely with the blocks. That's not what we're going to do. <laughs> we're going to start with big body movements, with kind of the big picture things that we do. And this is with movement, with gross motor play. So for initial peer engagement, we are going to start, and this is especially effective and especially, I guess, necessary would be our best word here, especially necessary when a child has very little social awareness. So remember, we've already talked about that example where a kid might be at a birthday party or on a playground or in his daycare environment or wherever he is, and we notice that he's he's really pretty isolated, meaning that he doesn't watch other children very much. He doesn't seem to care if another kid comes to him. He just turns away. If he's playing in the sandbox and another child approaches him, he just gets up and leaves the sandbox or he ignores the other child completely. So when we have this kind of thing going, we know that we've got to do something different uh, to be able to get that child to again get move move toward that social awareness so that he is routinely noticing other children he's watching other children and the very best way that I found to do that isn't with these little intense one-on-one -on -one activities it's with that big gross matter activity and so think about things like running like jumping like climbing like dancing marching rolling swinging anything that you can think of that involves a gross motor body movement that is going to be the very best way that you can get a child who is pretty uh, closed off socially to start to notice other children and I just I, I really first started to notice this like oh gosh 20 something years ago when I would go do daycare visits and I would be working with the child that I was working with and then we didn't have all the rules that we have now about staying with the child and you know sometimes we could pull them out and we didn't have to always keep them right there in their little natural environment but I would notice you know when we would go out on the playground I would think you know he is just he he doesn't look at another kid if they're both trying to play with the same toy when he watches other kids it's when he's a distance away and when they are doing Doing something big like running and so that I started to think what can I do to to make that make that more effective what what can I do and a lot of times I would even and I remember in this little guy that I would just say to his other his other friends I would notice in the it, that he would start to watch other children when they ran so I would just start to say to the other kids hey let's run because I would be so I was so aware that that really worked for him with the only time he notices other kids is when they are doing that kind of thing. And so that's what we want to do here is really introduce those activities where a kid might start to look at other children. And so these, these just loosely organized play where, again, a group of children are running on the playground. That, that's going to be excellent. Or a group of children are all doing something like jumping in a tra on a trampoline. Those kinds of things are really, really, really uh, the first way that we get children who don't even seem to be aware of other kids or noticing other kids to start to watch them. Uh, and, and, we, and we look for that. We, we watch our little friend to see what he's looking at and what he's doing. And so we, we, that's when we start to um, that, that's when we start to make some real progress in that. And so here's the reason why too. When we start to say, okay, I'm going to play so many expectations on this child. Like, let's say that we would say, we would want a kid to play a game like Duck, Duck, Goose, which is just a really fun kids game to play. Everybody sits in a circle, and you the they uh, the child as he's walking and again don't get hung up on well he's not talking so he can't play this yet uh duck 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 goose and when the child when the child is picked to be the goose the child who's sitting has to get up and run and chase the person who uh is the the tapper in that game or the person who was it and got to walk around the circle and so a lot of times before 
with our kids that we're working with with developmental differences by the time they learn the game and it takes them so much to really see the new game and really stick with it enough to learn it not to want to run away not to avoid it and, and they learn that they've got to watch the other kid by the time that they really sort of get ready to play the game is over and so again we place too many demands on their systems they just can't do it yet and so that's why these really loosely structured activities or gross motor activities are going to work really really better for a kid like that because they can start to watch other children and build that social awareness piece uh, and so when we do things like these free play activities like the unrestrained running uh, that those are going to be we're not going to over challenge that child's system as much so let's think about things like a ball pit uh, or a bouncy house or even something like a tunnel or we already mentioned a trampoline those those big gross motor kinds of activities are what we want to do and our only goal here our goal isn't for a kid to begin talking with and sharing in play with another child from the beginning no here our goal is just social awareness and just social interaction how long does he watch another kid does he smile at another kid does he look at another kid and this is going to be really really hard if joint attention is a problem let's the the best way too that we can uh, facilitate these kinds of interactions with kids is just by pointing out the other children that are running and talking about the other children and so you can see that if a, if a kid has joint attention problems if he and by that I mean that you you are trying to show him something or get him to look at something even if it's uh, a little further away and that's why we always use the point with that like look if he can't do that yet, then you're gonna to have to back up and work on that joint attention piece first before you would expect a kid even to be able to respond here with this, uh, in, with uh, just in this social awareness kind of situation. And so what do we do as the adult? As we think, okay, well, I'm gonna get ready and expose him to this. We're gonna have these opportunities for him to watch other children, but what can I as the adult do? Well, you don't want to openly interfere in any spontaneous play that might take place but you don't want to just observe either because a lot of times when we're just observing nothing else happens beyond what's already happening and so what I found in these situations uh, we're not going to just merely stand there we're going to actually participate in those kinds of things too and so like we talked about we're going to point out the other children and you you don't have to do a big formal introduction and I used to sort of try to do that too you know take my little friend Logan this is Brandon Brandon this is Logan Logan and then just kind of think uh, what do I do after that you can just don't even you don't even have to really do that you can just say talk to Logan about what Brandon is doing or even if Brandon is the kid who is neurotypical no developmental issues sometimes Brandon you introduce Brandon to Logan he doesn't know what to do either and so the very best things to do are just going to be to talk about the other child and say things like if you're on a playground and you're using the loosely structured running you'll say something like wow look at those kids wow they go 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 and again you're just get building that awareness that's your part there that you want you want him to see that now m lots of times when we see children watching other children once they've begun to watch and then they look back at you like oh gosh that's kind of cool you can feel your opportunity building to get them in there or a lot of times kids will just see other kids and you've gotten them to watch long enough and you've you finally gotten that awareness built in there they're going to naturally want to run in so you'll see your little friend uh, again just stop what he's doing and try to run with the other kids or he may not even do it immediately you may see him do it like 10 minutes later and you think oh he missed it and that's what I'm talking about the processing thing by the time we teach them the game the other kids are done they've moved on and you'll see your little friend trying to play the game 10 or 15 minutes later that's delayed imitation but that lets you know that's how long it took for for him to really kind of get it together enough to understand and process everything that's happening so that then he can do his part uh, so we can do some things here 
uh, to get that going, like pointing out other children. The next thing that you want to do, even in the context of that gross motor play, is work toward a common goal. So let's take something like running. So when we see children running, we, we need to make that a little bit more structured. So an activity that I use in the clinic here all the time is just running from point A to point B. And that might be from this wall to that wall. And we're all going to line up and do it at the same time. Now, will our little guy with autism be completely compliant from the beginning and wait until everybody's ready to run? No, that's why we're, we're, we're teaching that. We're working on that together. So you might do something like everybody line up against the wall and you do your best to kind of hold your little friend there and say, oh, let's get ready to run. And then say, ready, set, go. And then everyone runs to the other side of the wall and you all plaster yourselves there and you kind of wait a minute and everybody laughs and then you say, oh, let's do it again. Get ready, we're gonna run. Ready, set, go! And then everybody runs to point B. And so with your kid that you're working with, you're probably gonna have to help him. You know, tell him, show him, help him. You're probably gonna have to do a lot of physical assistance where you, if he's not wanting to run, you're gonna take his little hand and help him run. If he gets off track, he wants to go play with the blocks or the push the chairs or do whatever else is there, go get him and bring him back and really, really help him. At least for a few turns, enjoy that game together. And so other things that you can do, like we talked about, so in a ball pit, you're going to get Everybody has a common goal. And so, again, your goal, you, you, as parents, you think it's going to be share the balls, play nicely with the balls, blah, 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 blah. No, it's going to be something like we all throw the balls out of the ball pit or we all throw the balls into the ball pit. Or something like on a trampoline, as the adult there, you would uh, not just coach the kids. You're going to get in there and do it with them, and you're going to say something like, everybody jump, everybody jump, and you're all jumping. And then introduce something new like, let's all fall down. And then you fall down too. It's better if you don't have to do all the initiating there as the adult. And that's hard for us as therapists because, you know, we want to get in and make all that happen. But if another child does something that your child can repeat or your child can imitate, that's just gold. So if another child falls down, you say, oh, let's fall down. And you help your child fall down too so that you get him in the habit of watching other children and then doing what they're doing. And so imitation here, uh, we, could develop, we can start to see early imitation that we've never seen seen before with a child uh, and because he's simply learning how to watch other children and that we've made the activity so easy something that he can already do that we'll start to see that sort of imitation there too so let's think about other things that we can do with uh, the activities that we talked about uh, with the trampoline or the bouncy house, we can fall down with the running things, with the ball pit. You know, think about what's one easy thing that I can get every kid here to do. Now, remember, what, like I said, you're not just going to watch here. You really need to, to participate in that and become, become another play partner so that you can... Uh, facilitate those things a little more easily. And even with the other kids that you're working with who are uh, your other coachable kids, you want to, uh, again, have them listening to you and have them recognize that you're just not the teacher person there, but you're really also another participant making suggestions and doing things. Uh, like on a trampoline, you could maybe bounce on your knees or bounce on your bottom instead of uh, bouncing on your feet. So any little thing that you can introduce, introduce like that to get the other children to do it or the other child to do it and the child that you're working with is what you want to do. Other things here uh, that you could do with gross motor play like that are just toys like ride-on toys or toys like a, a baby stroller, a, a pretend, a play baby stroller where everybody has the same toy. And remember the goal here is just that everybody's doing the same thing without any negative behaviors. They're all happy and they're all on task. And the little guy that you are working with, a little guy or girl, is watching other children and becoming part of the routine. And it may not be interactive yet. They may not be, again, in a ball pit. He's not handing the ball to another child to throw. He's not there yet. We just want them happily participating and watching other children. Now, once a child masters those kinds of gross motor group things like the running or the ride-on toys or 
jumping in a trampoline or even on a bed with another kid, those kinds of things, then and only then is when you start to introduce a few more rules. So what might that be? That might be something like uh, cardboard blocks where you are, where you as the adult build the tower really, really quickly and then the kids knock it down. And so you can see, okay, we've progressed. We're not just pushing uh, the baby stroller anymore. We're not just jumping on the trampoline with other kids anymore. Now we're actually doing something together. And so those kinds of things are always really fun. Things like balloons or beach balls, where again, our activity is still gross motor. It's still a big muscle activity, but we're all sort of uh, doing the same thing. So with something like a beach ball, and again, you're not gonna have maybe an organized game of catch yet, but it's just that everybody has a beach ball and we're all throwing, we're all chasing the beach balls. We're all doing the same thing at the same time and we're all really aware of each other. Other things that work really well here are bubble machines and not just the single bl where you're blowing. Those are fantastic, but when we're working on peer interaction, you know, and, and especially at this stage, we need the bigger activities. So something like everybody runs through the bubbles together and we're all laughing and we're all looking at each other and, and everybody's popping the bubbles, but again, it's not, we're, we're all doing the same thing, but it's not necessarily interactive yet. So look at all that, uh, look at things that you can do during those activities to just build that awareness. Now, as you're doing this, be sure that you're keeping all the kids involved as much as possible. You're gonna focus on taking really fast turns and you're gonna, you're gonna address behavioral infractions, but you're not gonna focus on it. So let's say that you are using something like a bowling set. And this does seem like it's gonna take more turns. Like you, you have to get the bowling pin set up and only one kid can roll the ball at a time. But don't make it really like that. Don't do the whole, my turn, his turn, you have to share. Don't really work on all that yet. There's, he's not, the child you're working with is probably not ready, you're just building awareness. So you're just gonna do things like if one child you know, wants four turns in a row for rolling the bowling pin, of course you're not gonna let that continue unless, the other child that you're the child that you're working with doesn't really care if he's watching the other kid do that he doesn't seem to want to turn he's happy he thinks it's hysterical he goes over and just tries to kick the bowling pins down but he's still looking at the other kid and everybody's happy don't make him necessarily take a turn just do everything that you can to build uh learning to be together uh, the other thing that you need to do for during this stage especially is be really, really careful to watch for overstimulation during these early together games. So if you start to see a kid that seems to be about to go over the edge and you can look for physical things like, oh, he's sweaty. <laughs> he's been running so hard and playing so hard, he's sweaty. So he's about, he's, he's, it's about to go over to that uh, crying or he's about to get really upset and mad and you can just sort of see it start to happen carefully watch for that and then pull it back slow down the pace and one other thing that I didn't say with the ride on toys or the baby strollers or any kind of uh, beach balls or whatever you want to make sure that you have enough toys for every kid to have one because you don't want to get into those sharing battles you don't want to get into that and when you have too many toys kids just explore or they don't really play they kind of go from one toy to the next but when you have too few toys that's when those battles those property battles really possessive battles really really begin so make sure that you have uh, enough toys and again you're not going to worry about taking turns yet you're only what you're only looking for building social interaction and building um, that awareness of other, uh, with building awareness and, and kids watching and kids looking at and looking for and enjoying being with other children. That comes first. Uh, parachute play can be really fun during this too where, and again, you have to be careful that a kid is coachable enough, the typically developing kids or whoever you're working with, the other child, as well as the child that you're working with, that they understand the rules of the game and that they have enough ability to pay attention and stay with you before you're gonna introduce that sort of game. But parachute play is really fun there. Or even things like sliding on the playground, learning how to do the slide. Now, before we introduce these kinds of gross motor things in a social situation where we have another kid, you've gotta be sure that the kid that you're working with kind of understands what to do. And so if you have a kid that does what every two or three year old's gonna do, they're going to, with a slide, they're not naturally going to always have proper sliding etiquette <laughs> where they walk over and climb the ladder and then sit down immediately and slide down and then go back and do it again. 
all kids are going to want to stand up at the top and run up the slide from the bottom and that's fine we expect that but you certainly don't want to introduce peers into this situation when you don't have a kid who can follow the natural flow of the routine on his own before you introduce another kid. So that's certainly something that you want to think about there. All right, so that was a big part, this kind of step two, introduce loosely structured gross motor play with other children, one other child usually at the beginning with a very simple common goal. And as the SLP or as the parent, you need to know what that goal is. You're just going to have one goal is that your child happily participates in the routine and whatever the routine is. If it's in the ball pit, throwing the balls out, throwing the balls back in, jumping on the trampoline, pushing the toys, whatever it is, you keep your goals very, very uh, simple with those kinds of things and understand, really, really understand I want one common goal for the activity and my only goal for the child that I'm working with is that he happily participates. All right, so let, I've given you a lot of ideas there, so I hope that you're good with knowing what that is, where to start. So let's move on to this next stage. How do we bump this up? We're going to make it just a little bit more difficult. And here I like to use sensory play. So what do I mean by sensory play? This would be an activity like a sensory table or a, a a container with water you know water play it might be in a baby pool it might be that you just get a big rubbermaid container and fill it with rice or with beans or with something or it might be a little bit more advanced like we're going to talk about with something more arts and crafts like play-doh or painting or something like that so why does this work well, sensory toys work because a kid engages all of his senses you know he can see it he can touch it and feel it he can smell it you know if it's something like rice or beans or even water you know, can hear it as he plays and again that helps the child be fully engaged in the activity and so uh, we're going to use other kids to kind of uh, again something that the child's going to like but another real low pressure low involvement and with sensory play again you want to do just like you did with the gross motor play but you're going to make it a little more focused here in that we've got some fine motor components and there's something there are going to be more opportunities for imitation and because we've already built a child's social awareness of other children with the gross motor games the sensory play he's got he's got more more skills now he's he's more competent now he can, he can do other things now and so you introduce these things like uh, sensory play now sometimes parents will balk a little bit when you say that you're going to do these kinds of activities in therapy especially if you're going to do it at their home <laughs> because they think it's messy there's too much trouble that kind of thing but really help parents buy into this and talk about because this is novel and because this is fun and because this is something that all kids like to do and this is the kind of thing that we're going to expect him to be able to do when he goes to preschool we need to give him some practice where we can really make this easier for him where he can learn the routine and he's going to love it because it's something that he naturally wants to do and wants to stick with versus running off like we talked about being alone avoiding isolating himself this is the activity that we're choosing makes him want to stay and then we get to work on it with other children too now the other thing with sensory play that we want to that we want to really really consider is we only offer this type of play experience when a child is developmentally ready so if you have a child who's still mouthing lots of things or if you have a child that you think there is no way <laughs> that he is going to be able to sit down with another child with a box of beans and not just the only thing he's going to want to do is throw not just dump out that he's not going to be happy until every one of those 888 beans are on the floor you know that he's not ready for that and so you're going to pull back and you're not going to use this kind of activity yet or perhaps you'll pick another kind of sensory play that would be easier because if you are just only uh, monitoring behavior and you you just find yourself correcting the children don't throw the beans put the beans back the beans stay in here don't eat the beans there's no therapeutic uh, activity going on beyond that. All you're doing is just giving behavioral direction or behavioral directive after one after another. And so that's just not going to be effective for you either. So make sure that the kids are developmentally ready when you start to introduce these kinds of activities. And another thing that you want to do here, like we talked about with facilitating that early imitation, is add tools. So with something like... Uh, 
the sandbox, the tools that you would add, what would you add? You would add shovels if you are, or little buckets or any kind of little sand toy there. And don't go crazy trying to get 25 toys. Remember what we said, that if you have too many toys, what are kids going to do? They'll just explore and they won't really play. They're going to want to look at the eight different shovels that you have before they pick one to dig and dump. It would be a lot better if you just had two shovels or maybe three, you know, one for you, one for, uh, and one for each of the children that you're working with. And so add some tools there. It makes the sensory play more appealing. It creates more prospects and more opportunities to do some different things beyond throwing <laughs> the filler material that you have. So anything like that, measuring cups are fun for that, any kind of scooper, even just like big spoons from the kitchen, just some kind of tool that a child can use while he's participating in uh, the sensory in the sensory play experiences. And so what do you do with that? You know, a lot of times we talk about parallel play where a child is just playing alongside another child. And this happens in typical development too. There's not much interaction going on. They're just both happily doing the same thing like we talked about back with step one. So with step two here, we wanna make sure that we are uh, doing environmental modifications so that we can uh, the children will naturally notice each other. So you're going to put kids across from each other, not necessarily beside each other, so that they can make eye contact. And so that when they happen to look up, that other kid is right there. So adults should also join in this play. You're going to do the same things that kids do. And instead of chatting on incessantly like we as SLPs do, do some verbal routines. So that if you are with, uh, uh, let's say that you're playing together in, um, you, you've got a container of water there, or even you're in a baby pool and everybody's in the pool and you're playing together and what are you going to do just do some things like splashing and you would say one two three splash or let's say you're in a uh, playing with sand and you uh, I used this example earlier you might say you might just do a dig up dump dig up dump any kind of little whatever you're doing just make it simple and make it repetitive and say the same words at the same time and again you're trying to get all the kids to do this with you not just not just the kid that you're working with and remember what i said earlier if another child does something that you think your child can imitate go with that instead of you always leaving the routine there but help your other child again even if he's not quite able to do that direct imitation where he sees the other child use the tool and he wants to use it too just help him start to look at that and then use his own tool like that even if it's not just that direct imitation so that's another wonderful strategy so that was the third strategy the third step next after kids can do that then move on to these small group or circle time activities so circle time routines are so important because in organized child care or preschools we almost always have a gathering time at the beginning of the day and the end of the day and so our little kids with autism they either are great at it because they like what the teacher's doing usually teachers are going to use some some songs or so, uh, some books or a teacher-led discussion. And so a lot of times our little guys with autism love music and they're really visual. So they might hang in there to see the book if a teacher's showing and, and they have some pretty good sit down and stay skills already. They may do okay at circle time, but a lot of our friends don't. And so then they need that special practice. So we have to sequentially build that attention and help them learn how to stay with this kind of task. So action songs are great with this and preschool teachers really understand this. So songs like If You're Happy and You Know It, Wheels on the Bus, Itsy Bitsy Spider, Baby Bumblebee, Skinamarink, any little thing where, little routine where the child is watching and then he's doing the same body or hand motions as everyone else. It's so good if a child already has an interest in a song, if you can use that song in circle time because that will pique his attention and he will he will already be motivated to stay with that activity if he already understands what that song is uh, I love the little song where oh where and I've written about it gosh I think it's in teach me to play with you and it's probably in uh, the autism workbook and I know that it's in let's talk about talking those are three of the six therapy manuals that I've written and it's such an effective game so for this kind of little game everyone's gonna sit in a circle you'll you it's kind of a uh, jacked up peekaboo for toddlers but you put a blanket over one of the child's heads to hide and you sing 
uh, I'm just going to sing it here. Let's say the kid's name is Emily. Where, oh, where, oh, where is Emily? Where, oh, where, oh, where is Emily? Where, oh, where, oh, where is Emily? Where can Emily be? And then when Emily is at the end of the song, she's supposed to take off the blanket and everybody, you know, shouts and yay, Emily, whatever you want to do with that. But that's an excellent routine to have children become involved and watch their other peers and watch as someone else is covered up and do the big hand motions together as you're singing where oh where oh where is Emily they're all doing that together and so that's that is a another good activity to try another real fun activity here is a game like ring around the rosies where you have your little friend with autism hold hands with the other children sing the song and then fall down at the end and can you see how you're helping a child just sequentially work toward interacting with other children we started back at stage one with him just watching other kids as they ran and then we bumped it up a little bit and made uh, a little we, we made everybody have a common goal within that activity and then with sensory toys what did we do we wanted him if the other kids are digging with the shovel we want him digging with the shovel and now we worked all the way up to he's holding hands with other kids and doing what they do or he's he's doing the if you're happy and you know it he's clapping with the other kids as you know if you're happy and you know it clap your hands and so can you see how this is moving a child right along and so uh, that that's where we want to take this with these early circle time activities another really fun game here is a simple passing game so where we're all sitting in a circle and I've done a lot of therapy tip of the weeks about these kinds of activities so you take a little seasonal activity and let's just do it for summer because summer's here in North America and uh, it's something I haven't really I haven't really given this example before but we're going to take the same little game that we might use for uh, we we do it to the are you sleeping are you sleeping is the the tune here and so we might have all the kids sitting and, and for all the kids it might just at this point be you and the mom and a kid and another kid <laughs> and so you're just going to pass uh, the material around and so let's say you're for summer we would use something like a bucket like we would have at the beach and so we would sing pass the bucket pass the bucket all around all around summer is coming summer is coming to our town to our town and so the goal of that game is what it's just for your child to sit there with everybody in the circle and you just pass that bucket around or the shovel or the beach ball or whatever you use now don't use something that you think a child is going to want to take and run off and play with. Now, beach ball might be hard <laughs> for a lot of kids to have the inhibition to not want to take the ball and run, even typically developing kids. So be sure that you are, you are choosing your uh, materials uh, to not cause yourself more problems than you need to have. But look at that and look at what you can do with uh, just in any seasonal things. At Valentine's Day, you could use a heart-shaped candy box. In the fall, I always use pumpkins, and that's probably the example that I have most often at te on Teach Me to Talk or even on our YouTube channel so that you can see the videos there. But do a little song like that. And again, a kid is just going to learn. I, my only goal here is I'm going to sit, I'm going to watch the other kids, and I'm going to do what they do. But it's harder than we've talked about with the previous activities. All right, so that was step number four. And finally, finally, we're up to where we can talk about how do we get kids to really play with other kids with real toys. And again, you don't sit down with something at the beginning like Thomas the Train or something that they're just going to be completely obsessed about and not want to share. You need to pick what research tells us are better toys to promote uh, those kinds of sharing and equally participating opportunities. So house cleaning sets where everybody has a broom or a vacuum or a mop or dusting cloths or feather dusters. Melissa and Doug uh, make a cute little set that I've used for that, but you can buy those kinds of toys anywhere. If you don't even wanna buy the toys to do that, who cares? Just get the, get the real broom, but the child-sized versions are really good. But housekeeping sets are really great where again, Everybody's using the same kind of toy. 
everybody's doing the same kinds of things and here you can start to introduce some really early taking turns and by that I mean the kids are just going to trade so if one kid has the broom and one kid has the little vacuum you're going to help them learn to use their toys and then we're going to start to make some simple trades other things that work really well here where everybody's doing the same thing you all have a toy you're all sort of enjoying it together but it's not that quote unquote sharing uh, dress up sets things like you know you have a lot of hats and if you can have or little uh vest or you you might want to at the beginning go with things that are going to be easier for your kid with autism to put on and remove by himself if you try to get like a big princess dress and it's going to take to an adult and the kid to get it on that's too hard for the beginning but things like hats things like scarves mittens uh, shoes kids love to wear oversized shoes those kinds of things where you're all putting on the dress up clothes a mirror makes that really fun where everybody can look in the mirror and and kids then can look and see their friend as they are looking at them and then look and see their friend in the mirror that's really cool those kinds of things work really well too uh, early dress up sets here even playhouses or little tents where there's something to do not just kind of uh, like with a tent that may not be the best example because uh, this this well it's a great example but you want something that would be fun for a kid to just kind of run in and run out but you want something to do in there so if there's a little play kitchen where they're going to pretend to turn on the water or even if there are kids not pretending yet that there are dishes there that he can cook with and physically manipulate where there's something to do that's when kids are going to be ready for this kind of thing and remember as the adult you will still facilitate this play you will still get in there and say you know you're going to pr pretend you're going to take your the cup and you'll say let's get some water and you'll put it under the little faucet and tsh, pretend that you're turning it on and then you'll pretend that you're drinking that water from the cup and you'll get all the children engaged with that and so but you can see if you start with that kind of activity how a child might really struggle with that but we've really built him up to that remember we did the we worked with adults and then we did the gross motor play and then we had a goal with the gross motor play and then we did sensory play where we brought in tools and we're all using the same tools and then we did circle time activities where we're all singing the same song and we're all looking at the same book we're all doing the same kind of goal and 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 then you know we work up to where we have these props or these toys that really promote that interaction back and forth and so you can't start here but <laughs> like I said at the beginning some kids with autism really might be at the point where they're already doing the gross motor play you didn't have to help them do that they're already doing the sensory play and watching other kids you didn't have to help them do that uh, but but you may find kids again that you can kind of put into either any of these five stages but I've just really found that if I sort of start with the kid at the beginning and walk them through that's good but let's look at the exceptions here and so I use a set of questions for this and this is in um, the autism workbook you can go look at that specifically so let's look at these individual child preferences as we finish up this show so what do we do if a kid if we're looking we're trying to find the correct stage to kind of plug him in here with these five stages uh, to facilitate peer interaction so what do we do with a kid that just is sort of starting to watch kids play from a distance do we think he's ready to go down into this fifth stage no we're going to put him there in that first stage he doesn't really need adults yet or, or he doesn't really need adults because he's beyond that he's past that he's ready to watch other kids so you would jump straight into stage two there with that gross motor play where he can watch other kids and then you're going to help him move toward that common goal what if you have a kid who avoids other kids when uh, she's playing with them or, or not when she's playing with them but she avoids other kids in those kinds of play situations you would know for that kid what oh I better start with an adult she needs an adult to help her learn how to do this interaction stuff we can't start with kids she's afraid or she's aggressive or whatever whatever the problem happens to be you think oh I better not start with other kids I better start her back with here at stage one because she's telling me she can't do the other kid thing yet what if you have a child who's just obsessed with music that is you know wherever she is she's not 
she doesn't engage with you. She's doing her own thing, but you start to sing and she is right there with you. So for that kid, you know, boy, I could probably start with some circle time activities here because she loves music and that that's her preference. And that's where, where we're going to go with that. So look at that. What if you have a kid who, again, is so tactile. He's just, he's just always into things. He's just always wanting to put his little hands in things and just or cover his body with things. And then, you know, oh, that's sensory play. Let me start with sensory play with that kids. So you can use a child's individual preferences to figure out how can I get in? What's the best way for me to start with this kid? But certainly know that when you work through these five stages uh, that, that, that you're covering all your bases there. You're gonna make sure that you have provided a foundation uh, for that child to be able to interact with other kids. I hope I've given you some new strategies for this show today. This has been one of the most fun and challenging <laughs> goals that we address with kids uh, with autism and certainly as SLPs it's certainly something we want to do we think about it all the time and as a parent of a child with autism you think I don't want my kid to be left out I want him to be able to go to school I want him to be able to fit in this is how you do it work through those five stages and take a kid from where he is even if you have to start with what his activity preference is know that these stages are there and that you can go back and pick something up if you need to in the earlier stages and certainly help him move forward when you've seen that his skills are there and he is ready. All right, you can get more information about this approach in my treatment manual, the autism workbook, and you can find the link that there uh, below the post there on YouTube. If you are listening with your podcast app, uh, all this information is at Teach Me To Talk. All right, uh, that's it for today. I'm Laura Mize, pediatric speech language pathologist, and thank you so much for joining me for Teach Me To Talk, the podcast.